Amen. The freedom that we got by what Jesus did is an eternal freedom. It's not a temporal freedom. It's not a conditional freedom. It is eternal. That is, that, that is referring to the effect. That the effect of what Jesus did, the freedom that was purchased based on the price is an eternal freedom or an eternal release. What we have is eternal. Having said that, let's look at what is vital here. That the price paid by Jesus now relates with eternity. The price that Jesus paid relates with eternity. Eternal means it cannot be changed. It cannot be changed. So he came and paid for slaves. Two things happen. Number one, when you pay for slaves, the slave is no longer the, under the slave owner. The slave is no longer under the slave owner. The moment a slave is paid for, he is free from the slave owner. Do you know that is how people still see salvation? Like Jesus came and paid the price for my sins. So Satan, you have no more hold over me. But don't forget, it is an apolotrosis. That is, it deals with an action. It deals with an action. So Jesus paid the price and made it impossible for man to be repurchased. Jesus paid the price because it's apolotrosis. After paying, he now makes it impossible for man to be repurchased. That is why something like losing salvation doesn't come in at all. Now, what he has done is he has set you on an eternal course. So for whatever reason, he bought it is eternal. The salvation Jesus provided has eternal effect. Eternal effect. So what we are celebrating is the eternal nature of what Jesus has done. The eternal nature of what Jesus has done. That today, tomorrow, and forever, a price has been paid for me. Today, tomorrow, forever, a price has been paid for me. That's very important. And Jesus is that price. In this instance, Jesus gave himself to the slave owner. Jesus did not pay the price. Jesus is the price. He didn't pay the slave owner something. He gave himself to the slave owner. So Jesus is the actual price for our redemption. And that price is eternal. That is the price Jesus paid for our salvation, which is our redemption, is his person. So let's go a bit more in detail. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Everybody knows that man's sin. Romans 3 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. All have sinned. So since all have sinned, the wages of sin is death. Not the wages of God. The wages of sin. Not the wages of God. The wages of sin. What is a wage? A wage is a payment or the payment of sin. Where do you get a wage from? It is a reward, meaning you have done something. When you have done something, you are paid wages. When you have done something, you are paid wages. So, the wages of sin is death. Notice, he didn't say the punishment of sin. He said the wages of sin. Because people believe that God punished man with death. Mm -mm. God did not punish anybody. He didn't call it the punishment of sin. He called it the wages or the salary that sin pays is debt. It is called the wages. That is why the next statement, but the gift of God, the wages of sin, but the gift of God, so both a wage and the gift of God are given. The wages are given by sin. The gift of God is given by God. Don't forget, it is wages, not punishment. The wages or salary of sin. And you cannot have wages if you never walked. You're only paid wages when you walk. So both the wages and the gift of God are given. One of them 
is deserved because it is a wage. The wages of sin is what a sinner deserves. But the gift of God is given to a man that does not deserve. Wages for a man that deserves it. The gift of God to a man that does not deserve it. So both wages and the gift of God are given. The other one is called a free gift. A free gift because it is something you don't deserve. One is what you deserve because you worked for it. Man actually worked for debt. Man actually worked for debt. The wages of sin. The salary that sin pays the man who sins is debt. It's not a punishment. It's a salary. It's a reward given in response to a performance. But the gift of God is to a man that does not deserve. Please, I need you to listen carefully because if you understand this, you won't be thinking of confessing sin. The wages of sin, the wages of sin, not the confession of sin. Sin does not have respect for confession. Sin will pay you wages. When you sin, you must collect your salary. Freedom from sin doesn't come by confession. It comes by wages. Freedom from sin comes by wages. So if you really want to take care of your sin, collect your wages. What is the wage? Debt. It's a legal issue. It's not a sentimental issue. It's like you committed a crime in the society and you're taken to the court of law and you're convicted and sentenced to prison for 50 years. And then you lie on the floor and start confessing and start crying. And your entire village comes to that court and lays on the floor and they are crying and begging and wailing. It does not change the judgment of the constitution of the nation because it's not a sentimental issue. It's a legal issue. Sin is a legal issue. Crying does not bring forgiveness. Begging does not bring forgiveness. Confession does not bring forgiveness. If you really want to take care of your sin yourself, then you've got to die. But listen, the bad news is that the death of a sinner cannot pay for a sinner's crime. So even if you die, it is wasted. That is why a God will come in the form of man sinless and die man's death. That's the whole reason for the incarnation. Because man cannot pay. <laughs> man can't pay. It's too expensive. Man can't pay for his sins. What sin has offered man is too expensive. It's death. So God said to Adam, pay attention. The day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in dying you will die. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. So man actually worked for it. Man actually worked for it. Look at Romans 5, 12. Glory to God. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Please pay attention. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. So the result of that sin is death. So sin is man's effort. Sin is man's effort. Life is God's gift. Sin is man's effort. Life is God's gift. And every effort is rewarded. That effort is rewarded with death. That effort is rewarded with death. And this is very vital to understand if you will understand salvation. You must understand that death that came by sin is a legal reward for the effort of the sinner. It's not a punishment from God. It's a salary from the employer who employed man to sin. And who is the employer? Sin itself. That's why it is sin that pays the wages. Man's effort brought death. God's gift is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Man's effort brought death. God's gift 
is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So let's go back and ask a question. Where did death come from? Clearly, death did not emanate from God because the Bible calls death God's enemy. Death is a creation of sin. Death is a creation of sin. Death did not emanate from God. Death was non-existent until man chose beside life. So death is the outcome of man's choice. By one man, sin is so komai, the Greek word. It means a foreign object that did not exist was introduced into the world and death by sin. So death is a creation of sin and sin is a creation of man. So by default, death and sin are products of man's labor. They are products of man's effort. God didn't create death at all. It is the sin of man that created death. Please stay with me. So, death was non-existent until man made a choice beside life. So, we have seen that death is a reward for a job well done. Death is a reward for a job well done. That great, wonderful great wonderful reward that death offers after you have sinned death will come and say well done you deserve me the wages of sin is death look at romans chapter 5 verse 8 you will love this romans chapter 5 verse 8 but god commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death. We sinned. Our wage is death. Jesus intercepted and collected the wages of sin for us and gave us an offer of life. That's the love of God. He intercepted. He collected the wages of sin for us and gave us the offer of life as a gift. So the wages of sin is dead. That means man worked for it. Now, now listen carefully. While we were yet sinners and deserve the state we were in and deserve the reward we got, while we were in that state, Christ died for us. That is where we can refer to death as a punishment. In Christ dying. Because Christ did not sin. So his death was a punishment to him. To us is our reward. Christ coming into the equation. What was our reward became his punishment. So the person that is punished is Christ. For our sin. If we were to harvest it. It will not be a punishment. It will be our reward or the reward for our effort our action and the reward for our work or our hard work but for christ it is a punishment that is he took on himself what was on us so death came to jesus as what he did not deserve death came to jesus as what he did not deserve please pay attention death came to jesus as what he did not deserve. If you understand what I'm teaching to them, you will never ask a question any longer on confessing sin. Death came to Jesus as what he did not deserve. Life came to us as what we did not deserve. Death went to Jesus as what he did not deserve. Life came to us as what we did not deserve. We deserve death. Jesus took the death he did not deserve to give us the life that we did not deserve. That's the grace of God. That's the love of God. That's the magnitude of God's love towards man. Now, Jesus, who is the ransom and the redemption for humanity, will not offer himself. I mean, will now offer himself. Remember, he will not pay for us. Remember, he will not pay for us. He 
is the payment. He will not pay for us. He himself is the payment. He offered himself. He offered himself. He takes on the responsibility. He takes on the responsibility. Now listen. Death is a state. So, him, the slave owner, was a legitimate slave owner whose weight is rightfully his. So, the measure and value of the slave, Kabayada, the measure and value of the slave is dead. The slave is useless where God is concerned. Because when the slave was calculated, his worth and his value is dead. And God was ready to invest into a liability. God looked at the slave in the hands of the slave owner who is worthless. Who does not have anything to offer. And God said, he is worth the investment. Right now he may be of no value. But the moment I step into his shoes, my value becomes his value. Shakolada. The moment I step into his shoes, my value becomes his value. Now, so the slave is no more valuable than debt. So if I am going to pay a price, the price value will be debt. If Jesus is going to pay the, if, if he's going to give himself as a price for us, the value of that price will be death. That's what the Bible says. He took upon himself the form of a servant, made himself of no reputation because we were of no reputation. Our total value was death. So God now decided to step into our shoes and identify with our worthlessness. And in that identification, invested his value into our account. So he became worthless to make us worthy. Worthless to make us worthy. He took my place so I can take his place. Zakolata. Zakolata. So, it's not just like magical death. Jesus didn't die a magical death. He didn't faint. He gave himself as the price. That is, giving himself as a ransom is dead. That's why Romans 4.25, look at the way brother Paul will communicate the thoughts to the church at Rome. Romans 4.25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification was raised again for our justification. That is, he was delivered up. He couldn't have done it any other way because the wages of sin is death. There was no shortcut. There was no diversion. The only way to settle the matter will be death. That's why in the Old Testament, they could only interplay with types and shadows. Because the death of Jesus was reality. So there was no other way to communicate it other than types and shadows. Helping the Old Testament people to see the import of what it is going to take God to free man ultimately from sin and Satan. Because the spirit man of man was dead. Man in the Old Testament had a dead spirit. There was no way, no other way. He was in a dead state. And that state is what Jesus came to pay for. So let's look at death a little more. What kind of death are we dealing with? What kind of death are we dealing with here? It's not the beating and the nails. You know, when they took Jesus, all that beating and all the nails that were used on him. And I'm not trying to downplay the import of the price. But that whole thing was not the main work. Criminals today in some places are beaten more than that. And they take it. So that physical beating that you saw in the passion of the Christ. That entire physical torture was not the price. It's a part of it. A very little part of it. We will look at where the full import of that price is. Now please pay attention. 
So we need to look at the debts. And in order for us to understand the import of the price paid for our freedom. So that when we are enjoying our Christian life, we enjoy with reckless abandon. So that when we are enjoying what Christ has done for us, we enjoy without apology. It is an understanding of what was paid or what was at stake to free us that will make you tell the devil you are too small to tamper with my relationship with God. This understanding is critical and fundamental. So let's go to the types and shadows. Remember, Jesus is a man. He is not an actor. The death of Jesus was not an acted script like Nollywood. It was not a cunningly devised fable. Uh -uh. It was not a cunningly devised fable or a script that is well written. Let's go quickly into it. Leviticus chapter 16 verse 5. Pay attention. Leviticus 16 5. We read to verse 10. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. That's Aaron is talking about here. Next verse 6. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats, underline two goats, and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one for the Lord, one for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. The other lot for the scapegoat, or it is also called in the Hebrew, goat of escape. Nine. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell, and offer him for a sin offering. Ten. But the goat, but the goat, but the goat on which the Lord fell to be the scapegoat or the goat of escape shall be presented alive. Shall be on the line that shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Now watch this. So two goats. Look at the process. Two goats. Look at me everybody. Look at the process. Two goats. One goat a sin offering. And what will he do with that goat? Look at Leviticus 16.12. Leviticus 16.12. We'll read till 20. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord. And his hands full of sweet incense beating small and bring it within the veil. Next verse. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. Next verse. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering. Pay attention. Shall he kill the goat of the sin offering? That is for the people. And bring his blood within the vial. And do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock. And sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. And before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place. Because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he comes out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. Next verse. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about 
and he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he hath made an end of the reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. So two goats. Observe what this will do. There was a sin offering and there was a live goat. This will allow the children of Israel to approach the tabernacle, the sin offering. That first goat, which is the sin offering, when it is killed, it will give the children of Israel access to approach the tabernacle. When the first goat is killed, please follow this. And then Aaron shall lay his hands upon the live goat and confess all the sins of the children of Israel and all their transgressions. Look at that Leviticus 16, 21 to 22. Leviticus 16, 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins. And putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. 22. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. So this is the live goat. First goat killed. Blood sprinkled upon the tabernacle for the people to approach the tabernacle for their uncleanness. Then the second goat will bear the responsibility. So two goats. One will be killed. One will be alive. The one killed, the blood will be sprinkled in the holy place. The one that is alive, hands will be laid, the sins of Israel will be confessed on it, and a fit man will release it into a wilderness that is not inhabited. Now please stay with me. Observe, it is for the people. And this second goat will be responsible. The second goat will be treated like Israel. The first goat will be offered for Israel. First goat offered for Israel. Second goat treated as Israel. I repeat. First goat offered for Israel. Second goat treated as Israel. Now observe. First goat killed. Second goat kept alive. So what relevance does that come in today? Look at Luke 22 verse 19. Pay attention. Luke 22, 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave unto them saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Observe, he broke the bread. How do you break bread? He tore the bread. Now verse 20 of Luke 22. Luke twenty two twenty. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Go to 1 Corinthians 11.24 1 Corinthians 11.24 And when he had given thanks he broke it and said, Take it. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Next verse. After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Give me verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death. Till he comes. So that means that the bread and the blood, bread and blood, deals with two aspects of Jesus' death. Remember, we're dealing with the legal and vital work of salvation. The two aspects of Jesus' death. That is the blood and the bread. 
the blood or yes the body in nature the body of jesus constitutes of the blood so the body and blood deals with two aspects of jesus death and you have seen again that the two goats deals with two different things in redemption on the day of atonement atonement means when the price was paid or the day of reconciliation so two things number one two goats two aspects one dead one alive the body and the blood two aspects of jesus's redemptive work now the goat will be offered on the day of pacification now let us go back let us go back to man please keep these details because they will, be, they will come in handy in a minute let's go back to man genesis to god said to man in the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall surely die so in genesis 3 man ate of that tree and man died but when he died did you observe that he still continued to live because the man died but the man was still talking he had died but he was still alive he had died but he was still moving and talking that means this man lived for over 900 years as a dead man so in genesis 3 the effect of man's sin is obvious his eyes were opened so he was dead notice man is a spirit he has a soul he lives in a body definitely man was dead in genesis chapter 3 and the resultant effect of that death has was communicated to him from dust you came to dust you shall return so spiritual death is the mother of physical death spiritual death is the mother of physical death please stay with me and pay attention we will see that very shortly the state man was after the fall produced physical death definitely that death is a state not just an experience or an encounter is a state it is a state that produces the encounter of physical death the state of spiritual death produces the encounter of physical death that is it's a state of things that is why ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 pay attention ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins but observe even though you were dead look at verse 2 wherein in time past you were dead but you walked you walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience and that disobedience is to the gospel verse 3 now among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and we are by nature a state we were by nature the children of wrath even as others the children of wrath even as others so we were dead in sin which means the dead is a state of sin that is the dead came out of sin a spiritual state a state of sin so there were two goats two goats one goat to be destroyed the other goat cannot be killed what was god communicating to them that man is a spirit that has a soul that jesus body will be offered and then jesus will be the that indestructible part of man so that means jesus will have two sides 
the destructible part and the indestructible part like the goat that will be used for sacrifice and the goat that will be kept alive the body and the blood two aspects the legal and the vital please stay with me now jesus body will be offered and then jesus will be that indestructible part of man his spirit will be presented to god and humanity his spirit will be presented to god and humanity so that goat was alive that goat is a type and shadow that represented the spirit of jesus that spirit of Jesus is what was paid for eternal redemption. Yeah. Look at 1 Peter 2.24. I'm enjoying myself. I don't know about you. 1 Peter 2.24. Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. By whose stripes you were healed by whose stripes you were healed. Did you observe that the issue with the second goat was not the sins laid on him. The issue with the second goat was the separation. Hands are laid on him. Then a fit man will carry him and send him to a wilderness not inhabited. So the issue was the separation. The second goat. The issue was the separation. He was taken to wilderness not inhabited. A separation. And he was kept in no man's land. So in 1 Peter 2, 23-24, it deals with the body of Jesus. He bore our sins in his own body. It deals with the body of Jesus. The first goat. The body of Jesus is the first goat. That separation is what we are going to look at now. The second goat. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Glory to God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be seen for us. Who knew no sin? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He made him sin for us. Who knew no sin? Let's observe. We said the second goat is for separation. And it must be presented alive. Take it away because that was the best way God could communicate with man's state. The spirit of man is indestructible. Yet it was dead. The spirit of man was dead, but it was not destroyed. Because the second goat must be released alive, must be presented alive. Death was defined in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3 as separation from God. Death in Genesis 2 3 was not extinction, it was separation from God not extinction because if he was extinguished that means he was finished and not alive but this goat the second goat will be separated and released to the wilderness alive that is man's state while he is alive and separated he will err and commit sin the first goat is to handle that side. The second goat will handle his spiritual state. Death. That is separation from God. Genesis 3. If you observe that the first communication of God with Adam was that God came to Adam, which actually never happened. It was just a communication. All right? God came to Adam and God said, Where are thou? Adam. Where are thou? At that point, who moved away in Genesis chapter 3? Was it God who moved away or Adam? Adam. Adam was the first. He moved away 
and God went looking for him at the cross who moved away God Jesus cried my God my God why has thou forsaken me so in Genesis 3 man moved away from God and from Genesis 3 God chased after man until Jesus showed up took the place of man when Jesus became seen God walked away from man God walked away from man for the first time God walked away from God for the first time the depth of the love of God towards man man moved in Genesis 3 in the redemption God moved and both are spiritual dead the separation of God and man is spiritual death that separation was spiritual death so Jesus died spiritually and he died physically because man died spiritually which resulted to physical death why because we are establishing the legality and the vitality of redemption Kalabada. we're establishing the legality and the vitality of redemption I love the way brother Isaiah will put it as I close this service. Surely he was wounded for our iniquities. Bruised for our transgressions. The chastisement of our peace was upon him by his tribes. We are healed. He took my place in death. I take his place in life. I was joined to death. Jesus, because of me, separated from God and joined himself to death and sin so that I will be separated from death and sin and legally joined to God. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Stand on your feet. That's all I've got for you tonight.